good evening to Enderby and any other communities that are listening in to these uh, broadcasts that the Chamber of Commerce's assets put together. Um, the Chamber gave us 12 questions, two of which are actually the same, so I'm going to answer 11 of those questions, and I hope you can forgive me for reading my answers, but in the interest of trying to get a full answer in a limited amount of time, I wanted to make sure that I didn't miss anything. So the first question was about how I would advocate for the implementation of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and the United Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And I can't pretend to understand the full scope of the issues with the First Nations rights and land claims. And any settler who does, uh, unless they're a historian or a lawyer, is probably disingenuous. But what I can say is that I recognize that I'm a settler on First Nations lands, unceded lands. I understand that the rights of First Nations people have been suppressed for more than 200 years and that the government of Can all the governments of Canada have not upheld the rights of Indigenous peoples that were given to them by the Proclamation of 1763 rights that have subsequently been upheld by our Constitution and the Supreme Court of Canada. I don't know what opportunities might present themselves where I could have any influence over the province's implementation of the Truth and Reconciliation Con um, Commission and under it, but I would do everything that I can to educate myself, and I can tell you that if those opportunities afforded to me, I will do everything in my power to push the government to work towards a new story, a better future, and a fairer society in which the people of this province are all recognized in the Constitution and live together under a fair justice system. I'll demand that they do what they have promised, which is to consult with First Nations communities and leaders, to share the resources included, including the land with the First Peoples, and to build a sense of community in this province where we can respect each other and live together without fear of prejudice and racism. And I commit to working towards this future in my own personal life, and I look forward to a day when Indigenous peoples have regained the pride and respect they deserve and are considered citizens of BC and a unique people under the law. The second question was about the Bruin Bridge project and why um, it doesn't seem to be happening, I guess. Um, so my understanding of the Bruin Bridge project is that it hasn't been done in con consultation with the people who live in the community and that what is proposed does not meet the needs of this community. And that's a problem. It's my belief that an MLA is tasked with representing the needs of the community that they represent. And if elected uh, MLA, my primary purpose would not be to represent the needs of my party or my government, but those of the people in my constituency who are affected uh, by the projects and legislation that are proposed. One of the characteristics of great leadership is the ability for the leader to get out of the way and not become the main focus of the mission. As a leader in my community, I believe in listening to the people I represent and fighting the fight that they cannot fight for themselves. As a union president, I was well known as a fierce advocate for my members and as a city councillor, I've shown that I'm willing to stand up against the status quo. If elected to provincial government, I would not sacrifice this quality and would be the fierce advocate that the Shushwap Okanagan need, North Okanagan needs. Third question is why is the province cutting scholastic funding? So in fact, the funding hasn't been cut. Enrollment in School District 83 has been significantly impacted by the pandemic. On September 23rd, the su Superintendent of School District 83 stated that the enrollment in our district was at approximately 94%. Yet the district is still being funded by the provincial government at 98.6%. That provides a significant amount of money over the amount that we would get if this level of enrollment was reached in any other year, not during a pandemic. In addition to the federal, uh, in addition to the um, provincial funding, there's uh, federal funding that has been committed to pro uh, school districts across the country, and the provincial government has committed another forty-five point six million dollars to implement safety measures and three million dollars to assist with technology that is needed during this unprecedented time. As a staff member at School District eighty three, I feel that the district and the unions have worked very hard to provide as safe an environment as possible. I know that the plan is ever evolving and members of all stakeholder groups are working together to react to situations as they occur. If the provincial government receives instructions from Bonnie Henry and her health team to change the way school is implemented, they will react as required. The safety of the children and staff in our schools is of utmost importance. Question number four is how do we plan to address the quality of life in BC for seniors? The plight of seniors in BC has been uh, an increasing problem 
for two decades and was severely impacted by the decisions of the BC Liberal government since 2003 when they implemented two pieces of legislation that cost 10,000 frontline workers their jobs and allowed private contractors to flip contracts. Women were disproportionately affected by this, causing thousands to end up in part-time, low-paying jobs in multiple facilities. John Horgan's government recognized this many years ago and immediately revoked the two bills in question upon election. This made it possible to institute a one-site order when the pandemic began, which has likely saved hundreds if not thousands of lives in seniors' care. The Horgan government raised the wages of these frontline workers and is committed to keeping that increase, increase once the pandemic is over. They have also committed to hiring 7,000 new healthcare workers, 2,000 of them in seniors' care alone. If you or a loved one is in need of seniors' care in the future, you deserve better than the BC Liberals and have been promised a better system and better care under the NDP plan. Question 5 says, how do you feel about the transportation options currently available in the province? So trans transportation is an important part of the fabric of both the urban and rural landscapes of BC and the Horgan government has committed to improving transportation throughout the province. Residents of rural areas are at a significant disadvantage when it comes to transit because it's expensive. It's an expensive service to provide while our density is very low. All levels, levels of government need to recognize the needs of their unique regions and work towards unique solutions that work for them. Question six is, uh, would I, I, I'm not sure if they mean me personally, but would an elected government, I think, uh, audit ICBC? Um, so questions six and eight are pretty much the same question. So I'm just gonna answer them both here at the same time. Under the Clark BC Liberal government, ICBC was used as a secret fund to give the appearance of balanced budgets to the people of BC. It was a dishonest and underhanded move that put the cost of tax cuts for the rich on the backs of working people across the province. David Eby and his team investigated the extent of this problem after they were elected and described what he found there as a dumpster fire. The NDP have been reevaluating ICB for ICBC for three years and have put together a plan intended to improve services to people injured in accidents, remove the requirements to battle for coverage in court where no one wins but the lawyers, and to reduce the cost of auto insurance by 20% beginning in the year 2021, so a few months from now. Question seven is, do you plan to raise the level of money given to disabled and the disabled and seniors? Uh, it's been described as shameful and below poverty levels. I can't argue with that. Supports for disabled and seniors are significantly underfunded. No one should have to live below the poverty line. But the big initiatives that could significantly impact this would come from a federal level. I believe national pharma care that covers prescriptions, dental care as part of our health care plan, and other initiatives like that would have an immediate effect on the cost of living for seniors and those who can't work and would help lift them out of poverty. Diabetes needs to be covered by our health care plan and hearing loss needs to be part of the Disabilities Act so that hearing aids are covered by the Pharma Care Plan. Rental subsidies as proposed by the NDP and deferred taxes for seniors are initiatives that can help. All levels of government need to work together, together to provide relief, particularly now during the pandemic. We're all going to get further ahead by pulling in the same direction together. I'm skipping question eight because I answered it in six and here's question nine. Are you aware of the ex escalation of crime seen after the end of the CERB in Enderby and basically what are we going to do about it? Uh, it's my belief, and this has been shown in multiple studies over many years, that people who commit crimes are often not bad people, but people caught in bad situations. I work in an alternate school in our school district, and daily I'm amazed by the stories that make up the lives of my students. Childhood trauma is the number one cause of mental health and addictions issues, and many criminal acts can be traced back to a life of poverty, addictions, divorce, abuse, and other traumatic events. I recommend reading some of the excellent material written about this phenomenon. It's my belief that when our citizens are caught committing criminal acts, they should have access to the services that will help them heal, which is not jail. Counseling, health care, connections, housing, and compassion are far more effective. Some of these are services that were severely impacted by the cuts of the BC Liberals and the effects have been escalating for almost two decades. The fact that crime decreased or increased after the CERB ended is a good indicator that if people can afford a home and enough to eat, they're less likely to commit crimes. It's not policing we need to increase, it's social services, which will help people get well and provide for themselves and their families. Number 10, 
If elected, what three practical steps would you take to put Enderby in the area or all small towns on a firmer financial footing? Um, each small town in BC has a unique fingerprint and the approach will vary across the province. However, we all depend on small businesses. The BC Liberals will tell you that the answer is to give tax cuts to the rich and corporations in hopes that the increase in their revenue uh, will trickle down to the rest of us. That's called trickle-down economics, and we saw the BC Liberals try that approach for 16 years. But experts will tell you that the trickle-down economics was debunked more than 40 years ago in the 70s. It doesn't work. More money in the pockets of big corporations disappears into the economies of other countries or is hoarded away in offshore bank accounts. The only thing that has ever worked to stimulate any economy is to put money in the hands of the people who will spend it. And that's us, you and me. We shop locally, we use our local tourist attractions, we eat in local restaurants, all supporting the very businesses that we're concerned about and we want to maintain. During the pandemic, the NDP have committed $300 million in grants and tax breaks for small businesses to help them get through this unprecedented time. Helping get people back to work at good paying jobs will complement this. <clears throat> we all need to get through this together and we need to be working together as a team. Question 11, what do you plan to do about the shortages of doctors uh, in Enderby? So, uh, this is another problem that was created by the BC Liberal cuts to the healthcare system. 16 years of cutting uh, funding to healthcare. It caused uh, doctor shortages in many of our communities. The North Shushwap had a particular problem as well. So the NDP have committed to open another medical school at Simon Fraser, U Simon Fraser University and have already begun to open primary care clinics in communities around the province. Hospitals are being planned in communities that need them and 7,000 healthcare workers are being trained and hired across the province. We see our neighbours in Alberta walking back a recent announcement to lay off 11,000 healthcare workers in the middle of a pandemic. Is that the future you want in BC? I sure hope not. Question 12. What is your party's stance on BC's substantial oil and gas reserves? So the NDP have been working diligently to find a balance between developing oil resources and keeping BC trades working and implementing the aggressive climate plan of Clean BC. Most of us agree that we need to transition away from the oil and gas industry and open up new opportunities in a green economy. John Horgan's government has already started moving in that direct direction with initiatives like the rebates for electric cars, the charging infrastructures being installed around the region, the ban on gas and diesel cars by 2040, and a commitment to be carbon neutral by 2050. The NDP will train workers in new industries to facilitate <clears throat> a transition away from oil and gas without leaving workers and their families behind, and without sacrificing our commitment to reduce carbon emissions and reduce our impact on the planet. So that's the end of the questions. Uh, I hope that uh, if you have any further questions, feel free to contact me. You can reach me at my campaign office or on the website at sylvialindgren.bcndp.ca. Thank you.